Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the fourth session of the five-day faculty development program on foundations and applications of Indian psychology, organized by the Department of Psychology, Dr. Mjar Jangli College of Arts and Science. I consider it my great privilege to introduce our resource person, Dr. Matthias Conlison. Dr. Matthias Conlison was born in the Netherlands and studied medicine and psychology in Amsterdam. He's deeply interested in the work of Sri Aurobindo, and when he was 27, he moved to India, where he has lived ever since. In Delhi, he has helped with the creation of the Institute for Integral Education and Human Values, Mirambika, and at present, he teaches the psychological aspects of Sri Aurobindo's work at the Sri Aurobindo International Center of Education in Pondicherry. He assisted with the publication of Sri Aurobindo's complete works and wrote a few articles and book chapters in Sri Aurobindo's contributions to consciousness studies and psychology. He also organized conferences, gave workshops and lectures, and edited books on the same subject. He maintains the websites of the Sri Aurobindo Center for Consciousness Studies and the Indian Psychology Institute. We are very happy to have you with us today, sir. May I request you to take over the session? I'm also happy to be with you all, and I'm looking forward to a real meeting. Um, part of that is, um, I'm, yeah, am I still there? Because I do, somehow don't see everything. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. No, 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 I'm very happy when people interrupt and ask questions. So uh, please do, yeah, because uh, some people say that people only learn while they talk, and so it is not very fair if I do all the talking. So please feel free to interrupt either in writing, I suppose there is someone who looks after that, or by uh, asking oral questions and coming in. Um, I was asked to talk about integral yoga. And I will do that only sideways, because um, all of us are somewhere else, all of us have a different background, and the choice of the system of yoga, the system of spiritual growth that you feel most comfortable with, the guru you choose, or the guru by whom you're chosen, all that's very personal. So. As far as I'm concerned, there is no need for everybody to follow integral yoga or anything of the sort. Everybody should follow what comes natural to him or her. I will talk about some of the ideas that are at the basis of integral yoga. And uh, because I think they are very useful for psychology. As some of you who may have attended a talk I gave a few years ago at uh, the same college, um, may know, I'm very unhappy with the philosophical foundation of modern psychology. In the beginning of last century, as all of you probably know, psychology tried to become a normal science, a science like all the other ones. And it shifted its focus from consciousness to uh, behavior. Now, the problem is that all other sciences are about the outside world. But if you study of human beings only the behavior, you, in the most literal sense, you only surface the absolute surface. If psychology wants to be a real science and be as useful as it can be, it should be brave enough to realize that all the other sciences are about the outside world that we look at, the part of objective reality, you can say. But that the natural territory of psychology is the insight, is the subjectivity. And there is plenty to study on the subjective side of the divide between subject and object. Values, 
meaning, beauty, love, care, commitment, pain, happiness, almost anything that really matters to people is actually on the inside. And even the outside world matters to us only after it has become part of our inside. The world matters because we experience it. And science is a very uh, one-sided, lopsided enterprise if everybody is only busy with the objective side of reality. It would be fine if all the different religions were as open, as inquisitive, as science was, as far as the inner reality goes. But that's actually not the job of the religions. Religions are into passing on the values of the past to the next generations. And almost all religions, in some way or another, tend to become communal, because religions are passed on within families. And so we have all these different religions that all see different aspects of the truth, and that have a great difficulty genuinely respecting each other. They could, in principle, because they have all, they're all, in the end, focused on the divine, and the divine looks after everybody. But in practice, that uh, conservative element, that element of focusing on the past rather than on the future, that element of holding fast to values from the past is important in almost all religions. That's its job in the society. The greatness of science is that it is willing to admit that it doesn't know. And because of that, it is open and it makes progress. But when science also becomes a kind of religion in its own right, and makes it a dogma that the world is only physical, and that only objective knowledge can be made reliable and true, then something very serious is lost. Because for ordinary human people, that is not enough. It is the insight that matters. And the problem is that science, because it is so progressive, because it has made such phenomenal progress in the last four or five hundred years, has become the dominant knowledge system in the society. And so many things, mainly the, the biggest problem is actually with education. Education is based on a very superficial understanding of human nature. And it is a kind of poor extract of what science has discovered, which is taught in education. And we are still stuck with many methods in education that actually come from old-fashioned behaviorism, which thought that everything that's important can be studied by looking at animals. It is even in still some modern textbooks, the text is still there, that we are actual, actually animals. And then something very serious is lost, because there is some truth in that, but it is not a full truth, there is something more. Now, how can we study that extra? Is it possible to study subjective reality? what goes on inside ourselves, maybe even the divine, with the same clarity, progressiveness, openness, mental rectitude, that have given these fantastic results in chemistry and physics. Because it's understandable that psychology, which tried introspection in the beginning of last century, concluded that it doesn't work that people can say very different things about what they experience, and that there is simply no way to find out which one of them is true. But what they didn't know is what the Indian tradition knows. And the Indian tradition has specialized in this area of consciousness. 
for thousands of years. And it has actually found solutions for the bad reputation of introspection. In ordinary introspection, the thing that modern psychology quite rightly try to avoid, although they have not succeeded because it's still being used, are very obvious because you look with a little part of your mind at another part of the mind. And because your ego is involved and you identify with yourself, you're partial. That is very much like a judge who has to preside over a case in which his own family is concerned. So it doesn't really work. So as long as you just look inside with the same mind that you try to study, you get conflicts of interest and regression, and there are all kinds of difficulties. So that is not the way to do it. But there is another way to do it. And that is trying to detach yourself inside from the activities of the mind, from your feelings, from your thoughts, from your perceptions, your sensations, from everything that goes on inside of yourself, till you find inside what has been called pure consciousness. And in a way it is pure consciousness because it can just watch without any preference, movement, in complete objectivity. So you can kind of from inside look at your own mental processes with the same objectivity that the hard sciences use to look at physical processes. Because you are not involved with your ego anymore, you have no preference that it is this way or that way. And that works. And it is because of that, that the Indian tradition has figured out things like mindfulness, uh, which actually work in psychotherapy, and all kinds of other interesting methods of meditation, self-observation. And as far as they are used at present, it is mainly because they give a kind of happiness, a kind of undisturbed comfort. But in the Indian tradition, they were not only used, as in Buddhism, for overcoming of suffering. They were also used to get at reliable knowledge. And they can actually provide that. And they can provide reliable knowledge about that whole subjective inner domain. And if you do that, and you begin to study that territory, you discover that it is at least as vast and complex and intrigue, intriguing and, and fascinating as the outer universe. And psychology will never reach those areas as long as it only looks at behavior, because that behavior is just the absolute surface. If you would compare research in psychology with research in medicine, for example, in medicine, you have uh, case studies, and you have studies in chemistry and physiology and microscopic physics and all that kind of stuff. Then you try out new procedures or new medicines or chemicals or things like that. And then you have statistical surveys. But in psychology, we are now finally, after many, many years, again open to qualitative studies where we are willing to listen to individual stories. So that first one, the case studies, we have got back. We, um, that second one, the study of our insight, the study of chemistry, physiology, microscopic studies of our own anatomy and all that, that's missing in psychology. Because there's no way our present methodology can study that. Because what we do, we just ask the general population what they think about themselves. 
you wouldn't dream of studying astronomy by asking the people on the street what they see in the stars. You don't do it that way. You study astronomy by making very expensive, very complicated, very refined equipment, and then ask some highly specialized people to look through those instruments at the sky. But in psychology, we ask the general public what they think, and then we do a statistical study about it. You don't get anywhere that way. And so even when we do statistical studies, they have nothing to be based on. It is as if you would study in medicine, you do all these statistical studies about which therapy works and which doesn't work. But you have no different therapies to start with, because you don't know what's going on inside. And so for science to make progress, it is crucial that you go inside, that you can look at the detail. And that is not something to be left to the general public. That is something to be done by the psychologists themselves. And so whether you follow a Sufi method or a Christian mysticism or whatever you use, but you have to look at the depths of your own nature then you become a good psychologist. And it is also when you know yourself really well, when you understand your own prejudices, when you understand your likes and dislikes, when you understand how you function, what you have, all the grooves you have, the strange things you have learned from your own childhood, when you have understood all that about yourself, then you can understand other people also much better. Because though all of us are different, it is the same kind of processes that are at work. And you can observe them in first instance better in yourself. At least if you use those methods of first becoming silent, first learning how to watch yourself impartially. And I think the best part of it is that if you really go inside, you realize that we are all not only connected on the outside, now through the internet and before by just looking at each other and talking, but we are also connected on the inside. And some people have more experience with that than others. There are people who don't believe in it at all, because they don't have the experience with it. But if you've ever met someone who is really telepathic, who just understands what other people think, in the same way that he understands himself, then there's no question of having any doubt about it. And you also realize that consciousness is really contagious. If you are with someone who is really angry, you have to do your best not also to become angry. And if you are with someone who is really happy, you have to be pretty stubborn to remain unhappy. Because happiness is also contagious. I've met someone, and he is actually the one who made me really feel enthusiastic about the Indian approach to psychology, who had so much inner happiness that everybody who came in contact with him, if you just sat next to him, you inevitably became happy as well. I spent a lot of time with him, and in all those years he had many visitors. They all have left happy, except one. One was very, very stubborn. He knew him from his childhood, and he would visit once in a while, and he would be grumpy coming and grumpy going, but he was the only exception. It was just not possible to be unhappy in his room. I've tried, and it didn't work. So I'm completely convinced that these things are contagious. You have an effect on each other. We are inside connected, and there is a lot of inner stuff which the spiritual traditions of the world know, 
which modern science is skeptical about, not because it isn't true, but just because they're also dogmatic about the physical reality being the main thing, and they are dogmatic about their objective methods of study, which are fine for the outside physical reality, but they simply don't apply to the inside reality. For the inside reality, you need the same mental rectitude. You need to, the same humility. You need the same freedom to look. But you cannot have your prejudices about whether the ultimate reality is per se physical or not physical. This same person who was so happy, I once went with him to uh, the uh, All India Medical Institute in Delhi, which is one of the best hospitals in India. And he had, for some reason, only one eye that worked. His other eye, he lost when he was three in a smallpox epidemic. So he had only one eye. And that eye was seriously uh, spoiled by diabetes and all kinds of other problems. So the ophthalmologist hardly could believe that this gentleman could read or could distinguish people because his retina was almost entirely spoiled. But I have endless examples of, first of all, that he was perfectly capable of reading, but that he also could recognize people at a distance at which I, with a perfect eyesight at that time, could not see who it was. And he recognized them and even knew exactly what they were thinking and what they're going to ask him when they would come closer. It's factual. And so I'm pretty sure that it is possible to kind of rise out of the limitations of our mental constructions. And that it is true that most of us, most of the time, most of the time, are completely limited to what our brains can do. That is a fact. But somehow humanity has reached the state where we can rise out of those limitations and understand things for which we have no physical reason to understand them. We can know things that you cannot possibly explain how you could know them in purely physical terms. And as far as science has studied them, which is not very far because it is very bad for your career to study those things, they call them nowadays uh, anomalous phenomena. But there are plenty of them and many of them have been proven very, very solidly. But yet mainstream science keeps it at a safe distance. And it's understandable because science is a very privileged knowledge system. Academics live very nice lives relatively to other people. And so people are defensive about it and try to keep it safe. But if science was more honest, less defensive, it would study those other things. And it would admit that if you want to study consciousness, you have to do it by increasing, improving your inner instrumentation of knowledge. And these spiritual traditions have figured out how to do that. And I think that India as a culture, as a country, as a, as a region, a civilization, has done the best work in that area because it has really been the focus of the Indian civilization for thousands of years. And so that psychology is still centered in Chicago and still works largely from the surface towards the depths is, I think, quite a, it is a serious loss. Because all the problems humanity has are all in the end psychological. The problems that we have politically, the problems that we have about uh, democracy, the problems that we have with the climate, 
the problems that we have with the absurd difference between the wealthy and the poor, the horrible problem that we have in education, that still most children in the fifth standard can hardly read the second standard books. There are so many things where society simply has not yet got its act together. If you just see an objective, uh, an outside picture of science, psychology hardly appears. There's hardly any funding for it. That uh, it plays hardly any role. It is all about physics and medicine and chemistry and things like that. Well, psychology is at least half as, as important as all the other sciences together, because all the other sciences are about the outside, and this is the one science which supports the inside. And personally, I think that it is the most important science, because if you get that insight right, the outside is always bearable. While if the outside is right and the inside is not, you're still in a mess. So, I think so, humanity, it is high time that we pay way more attention to the inside, that psychology becomes a proper science of consciousness, and that we try to understand how consciousness actually works. And we have a kind of head start, because there's a lot known about it, but not inside science. And we have to kind of distill it, because we have to free it from the way it got its form in the past. Because that is always culture dependent. And we have to find the universal aspect of it. We have to find the parts that are not dependent on this religion, or that religion, or this culture, or that culture. We have to somehow find the not the abstract, because it is still very personal, but the deeper reality that's behind all these different spiritual approaches, and bring them together. Because we are not local anymore. Nobody is. 40, 50 years ago, you had still whole villages where Nobody had been outside, except maybe to the town, just five kilometers further. Most people spent all their time in their own surrounding. But thanks to television and computers and all that, nobody does that anymore. We are all connected, all the time. There is really only one global civilization at the moment, and it is Wonderful to keep all these separate cultures. They all have some contribution to make. But they have to make that contribution in harmony with the rest. And where do you find that harmony? You can try to find it on the outside, in the sense that we all have the same computers and the same mobiles and whatnot. But it is safer to find it on the inside. Because in the end, we all live on the same planet. And there is only one divine looking after all of us, whether we call that divine this way or that way, that depends on our culture, but the divine is only one. And we have that fantastic inner freedom to explore this world, to explore the outside, and to explore all those inner riches. And the inner riches are in many ways even more fantastic than the outside ones. So we don't need to be afraid of it. We don't need to be scared. It is true that when you start looking in psychology, the first things that come out are all our problems. It is very well known that psychology students and medical students typically think that they have all the possible diseases and neuroses and psychosis that anyone could have. And there is that old story about the churning of the ocean. So if you start churning your personality and your subconscious, the first thing that comes out are all the poisons. But it doesn't matter. 
Because in the end, Sir has lost his connection. I'll just uh, try connecting to him and uh, check what went wrong. There was some uh, connectivity issue on uh, Matthias's side. He'll be joining in a minute. Extremely sorry for the inconvenience. Yes, sir. Yeah, it seems I'm back. Um, it is. Am I back? Uh, not yet visible. Um, you're uh, yes, sir. Now I'm now I'm fully back. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Um, maybe I've gone a bit too far ahead, or uh, my theories have become a bit too wild. So. Um, I would personally prefer if uh, people can start asking questions or give their comments. Because I've lived for many, many years outside the uh, scientific mainstream because I had the feeling that I could understand really much more from psychology if I would study people like Sri Aurobindo than if I would study mainstream psychology any further. And so my way of thinking is quite far away from where most people in psychology are. So I think it's better that uh, you give your comments and let us get into a real uh, discussion. Would that be possible? Yes, sir. Uh, there is actually one uh, question in the chat box. Huh. Uh, by Ari are emotions and consciousness the same thing? No, no. Um, you could look at consciousness a bit like the carrier wave in uh, in uh, in mobile communication. Consciousness is the background. Emotions are like the 
uh, that's the kind of lived experience of uh, animal kind of nature as we still have and uh, so it is half physical it is half mental it has to do with uh, information processing which in us is done by the brain consciousness adds to that consciousness is the the light uh, in which those uh, emotions are seen it has been compared to the stage on which the drama is enacted so consciousness is not the emotion, is not the drama, but it is the carrier of that drama. It is the carrier of that thought. Yeah? And that is the reason that consciousness is there actually in absolutely everything, even in the physical structures. But the consciousness in physical things is different than the consciousness in us. Because we have this highly complicated uh, brains and we identify with the information processing the thoughts the sensations the emotions that take place in our physical structure but consciousness is something that's universal so in us our consciousness gets entangled in emotions gets entangled in thoughts gets entangled in physical sensations but by itself, consciousness can also manifest the universe or be limited to one rock or one stone or one river or one cloud or whatever. Yeah? Consciousness is an element of everything that exists. And in us, it is awareness and all because our brains are made like that. You need to think quite differently before you can really understand how consciousness works. I think it's quite comparable to what happened in physics. Earlier we thought that the whole universe, the sun, the stars, the planets, everything was circling around our little earth. And as long as we thought like that, physics could never make any real progress. Could make a little progress, but it would get stuck. Because that's not how it is. Physics could really start making quick cumulative progress when we realize that we are actually turning around our axis with the Earth and that the Earth moves around the Sun like the other planets and that the Sun is just one star somewhere in this huge universe. So similarly, I think we can understand consciousness only if we realize that our standard way of being conscious is just one of the many ways that it is possible to be conscious. And there are much more simple, much more, uh, really much more simple ways of being conscious, like in, say, a rock or an electron or something like that. And there are much wider forms of consciousness, like in some maybe wise people or in the end in, in the divine. So consciousness also has a huge range and we are somewhere in the middle. But our way of being conscious is not that privileged. It is privileged for us because it is the way we are conscious. But there are simpler ways of being conscious and more complex ways. And uh, what is really great about the human situation is that we have that, that freedom. We can move, we can change ourselves. We have somehow specialized in changing the world. And that we mess up very, very badly. The, the world is going to base us if we continue as we do now. So we should focus a little more on how to change ourselves. But in principle, we can do that as well. And if we put enough collective energy into it, I think it should work. Yeah, sorry, it is a very long answer to a short question. We actually have a uh, next, next uh, continuation of questions. How exactly is his consciousness manifesting? Sorry, how exactly? Exactly is his consciousness contagious? Oh, how it is contagious? Um, yeah, to some extent, it simply is. If you are with someone who is in a certain mood, you are quite likely to catch it. It depends on your sensitivity. Some people don't have it at all. 
they are quite enclosed. But other people have it much more. And if you want to be good at psychotherapy or counseling as a psychologist, you should be able to feel how your client is feeling. Then you should also be able to step back from it to help that client to see that you can actually get out of that situation. But to some extent, counseling works by giving people the understanding that you really understand their problem and that you that for you it is it can be solved. That is not hopeless. That even if you understand their problem fully, you can still see a way out. If they really get that, then they can get hope, they can start working out how they can get out of their situation. So some of it is on the surface. Some of it goes through words and expressions and all kinds of things that covers it up. But underneath that, there is a kind of direct influence. I don't know if you have personal experience with telepathy. Uh, I see amongst my students, many, many have it, not all. But there is a definite percentage of the population that is that has sometimes that they really tune into other people, whether they are present or not present. We are connected inside. The, according to Srebindo, for example, he says that the barrier between people is actually not between people. It is the barrier in us, between our surface consciousness and that deeper connection, that deeper consciousness in which we are connected with everybody else. So deep inside, we are connected to other people. We can't help it. But our surface co consciousness is separated out from our own deeper consciousness, which knows that oneness with other people. It is a complex issue because you have people who don't have it at all. They, uh, like if you don't feel at home in the world, if you really feel others as radically other, you're in a very deep, deep state of trouble. And you have wise people who feel really personally connected to everybody. There's a big range, and most of us are somewhere on that, on that trajectory. I there, think you, yeah. There are two more questions. Yeah. Uh, one is uh, how do we establish reliability for uh, subjective evidence? For subjective evidence. Subjective evidence. Yeah. Um, one way you can compare it to is to astronomy. In you can do no experiments in astronomy, or at least very very few. Uh, astronomy makes progress by making better and better instruments and then studying these instruments and see where they are perfect and where they make errors. So you use a new uh, telescope first on things that you know, then you see what errors they make, you correct those, and then you use it for new things. So in psychology, what we should actually do is the same thing. We have to change our own inner perceptions, our own way of looking at our own consciousness, at our own mind, at our own emotions, at everything that happens inside ourselves, till our own instrumentation, our inner instrument, has improved sufficiently to observe truly. It is a matter of making your own inner instrument of perception more reliable. And we should learn to trust that. This idea that you can study psychology by questioning large groups of people, I think is very absurd. That's just not, that's just not, not cutting it. It is really like doing astronomy by asking the people on the street what they see in the evening sky. It is interesting in its own way. But astronomy will never move forward. 
it is moving forward when you train people in very detailed perception of what happens in the sky using the best instruments you can find. And in the case of psychology, the instrument is insight. You have to learn how to purify your own instrument of inner knowledge. And that is what all the mystical traditions have done. And humanity as a whole actually knows how to do that. It is just that academics is kind of haughty and doesn't want to look at it. But the methods are there. And in a way it is very straightforward. You, you have to become, uh, to gain equanimity, become less egocentric, less egoistic, more free, more open. And uh, it's a matter of discipline and, 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 and effort. And it can be done. Is this an, an answer? I mean, it is, a, it is a very complex issue, obviously. So I can only indicate some very, very large lines. But do we have have uh, uh, yeah this is basically the same question as the previous one and it is a very important question because if this doesn't get sorted the psychology will never get anywhere. We have to get this sorted. One objection against going inside is uh, what people always say is that it is private. No? You have private access to your own consciousness. Someone else cannot see or at least not easily see what's happening in your consciousness. But that's actually no objection. Because in psychology, you're not interested in actually what happens in one specific person. You're interested in a process, which is generic. So if one person figures out that in certain circumstances, if he does certain, makes some certain inner movements, he has a certain effect inside. Another person can try in the same similar situation to make the same inner movements, inner gestures, and then see if that leads to the same kind of result. And that works the same as in science. In science also, it is very rare that you go back to the actual data of the other researcher. And it is only possible now because things are on, on computers. Earlier, the only thing a scientist could do is make notes, laboratory notes. And other scientists had to believe that this man is genuine and sincere and writes proper notes. And for these inner studies, it is basically the same. You can make laboratory notes. You can say, if I concentrate in this manner, I get that kind of experience. Or I get an experience somewhere in the range of from here to there. Then someone else can make that same inner, inner trajectory and see whether he gets similar results or something different. If it is something different, then you can try to find out what's actually the difference between these two people. Has one actually made slightly different inner gestures than the other person? And I think that basically works the same in, in inner studies as in outer ones. We have only to get used to the fact that the psychologist is his own instrumentation. You can, as a kind of intermediate stage, do qualitative studies about people who have done a lot of meditation. Then you can try to understand their processes. But the problem is, you will only understand what they have gone through, if you've gone through something similar at least. Otherwise, you will not be able to understand what they say. Just like a mathematician cannot explain his mathematics to anybody on the street. It doesn't work. 
he can explain his stuff to someone else who has a similar background. And to some extent, that applies for these inner realities as well. Which you can learn, where you can focus, you can try to understand. And collectively, we'll, if more people do it, more we will get better at it. In India, you have very good cricket players because every single boy plays cricket. Then you have a good chance that you get a few really good cricket players. So if everybody is encouraged to look inside, try to improve himself, try to get more clarity in his own consciousness, you will get people who can take the field further. And there have been cultures where that was done, like in Tibet, and to some extent in India. But right now, everybody is busy with uh, programming, so that's what humanity gets good at. And uh, you people, at least, are all trying to study psychology, so in a way, that's much more needed at the moment. But psychology has to be studied by going inside, not by doing statistics on what other people see. Thank I, you. I, I'm afraid I cannot go into the detail because it is like you cannot give a half an hour lecture on how does physics work. I mean, it wouldn't work. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> but uh, the basic technology is there that people have sorted it. There is an endless literature about inner studies. And uh, But you have to get into it. You have to do it. You have to try. You have to learn. And the good thing is that the more you do, the happier you get. Because inside, in the end, uh, there is that old Indian idea that the whole reality is made of sat, chit, and ananda. So the closer you get to the truth, the happier you become. I think that, that just works like that. So it doesn't work all the time. Sometimes you discover difficult stretches which you have to struggle through. But in the end, it works. There must be many more questions. If not, there's something had went very badly wrong. Please, if there are any questions, um, you can post it in the chat box or unmute and ask. There is actually, actually one question, question from, from uh, my, uh, side, my side, that side that I wanted, wanted to ask. To ask. Uh, hmm. How do you bring in this readiness, readiness uh, uh, on the part of the, part the students, students to, to understand, understand this? this? Because, because many, many of them, them they, they don't, don't really understand, understand the value, value of, of why, why we should, we should actually, actually go inside. inside. So how do, how we, do actually we actually get them into this track? The main thing is to do it yourself. That sounds a bit nasty, but it is true. Because if they see that you have gained something, they will see, hey, this seems to be worthwhile. Then they will try to find out why you have a kind of happiness that they don't have. And they will try to follow. Or why you have a deeper understanding of what's going on than they have. Then they will try to find out why the heck you have it while they don't. So to some extent, it goes by example. And the problem is that the, the students you get have already gone through 15 years or so or 12 years of education. And our entire education is geared towards the surface. It is all geared towards uh, competition, being intellectually good, being successful, earning money. It is all in the opposite direction as these inner studies. So, uh, every one of us has to unlearn a lot. I remember very vividly, when I was about 20, I had somehow ended up in Thailand, somewhere very far away from big cities and all. And one local monk, 
He said the world is actually made out of consciousness. Consciousness is the primary thing. And I remember very vividly that I thought, wow, why has nobody ever told me this before? I had really the feeling that this was the first time someone told me anything that really made sense. And our entire education is the other way around. It is all based on the outside. We all think that the physical reality is primary, that our consciousness is entirely dependent on the brain, that the economy is the most important social science. We, we are completely on the wrong track. And the good thing is that nature will not allow it any further. Because if we go on the way we have been doing, we'll, we'll definitely ruin the whole planet and our own existence. So humanity has to learn. And uh, if we learn in time, then uh, things will be very good. Because I think the inner sciences can go faster than the hard sciences have gone. Because the, the, the real inner knowledge is already there in people. It has just to be found back. So it can go fast. But we have to start on it. And if we don't, then we are in very, very deep trouble. There's no doubt about that. It, it will be very painful. Yeah. Thank you, Thank sir. You, sir. Uh, do uh, you have, do you have any more questions? Okay. Alright. Thank you for the questions that you have given. And uh, unfortunately, very few of you had your video on, so I haven't seen any of you. But I think uh, uh, there is there one is more one question. question. Okay, any good. recommended, any recommended books, books on the on research, research studies, studies on consciousness? On consciousness? Yeah, I will. Uh, I think I will send you an email with a few links. Yeah, then sure, uh, sure. you can pass that on to the people who are on this uh, on this meeting. Yes, sir. I'll do that. I think that will work faster than uh, me just giving because... Yeah? I'll do that. I'll thank you. Yes, yes. Um, okay. Do we have, have any Good more question. questions? That's like in a proper research paper. The last thing is always a recommendation for further studies. <laughs> so that's how it should be. That's probably a good question to end with. Sir, sir. Oh, I don't, I don't think, think we have, have uh, any more questions. All right. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very, very much, sir, for the time, time and for the beautiful session, you. which was so practical and, and uh, which, uh, which anybody, anybody here could easily apply in their life, life, especially as educators. <laughs> Thank you Thank very you much very for the session on behalf of the college and the and department, department and okay. all the participants. I, I thank you. Uh, I, I express my gratitude. Thank, Thank you very much sir, for joining us. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you, organizers.